everybody, welcome. We're going to be doing a little ditty on hard drive technologies and how they relate to computer architecture. This is going to be for a class through Grand Valley State University with Professor Kermis, and it's going to be presented to you by Nick Tolbert, myself, and Matt Offringa. A bit of general information and history on hard drives. Uh, they originally were very large, uh, as you can see in the picture, the one of the original ones. Um, it contained several discs with heads that would actually record or read each disc and normally those are about seven to eight nanometers uh, from the disc itself and in between each disc however you know with what we're going to be talking about that'll actually change and show you how that's changing um, previously it was on is north or positive uh, per bit or magnetic location um, the bits also need to be separated and you know that only means that they need a buffer zone um, so with one bit it actually could not be placed right next to another bit because with the reading it would actually overwrite or corrupt the locations near to it and that's another thing that we'll be talking about is it's something that technology has been looking at to minimize reduce or eliminate altogether the more major ways that hard disks are looking to improve in the past years and the future ones is with aerial density or how many bits we can squeeze into it well for this example square inch um, the bottom here on the x-axis actually shows the years uh, since the turn of the millennia so we're talking about 2001 to 2010 here a um, little bit of a dated graph but it still holds very true and it shows some of the reasons that we've started branching the way that we have um, <clears throat> you can see here as we've gotten into more mobile technologies and with such we've needed a higher increase in uh, aerial density which has led to perpendicular recording and such things here um, we are we currently were expected to hit right head limits um, in about 2006 which explains a lot of the newer technologies dealing with modified right heads and how those can be applied or what impact those have on how the disks themselves are created or how the disks are read and the read times from that. These graphs show a little bit of how the new technologies with both SMR and Hammer can influence and grow uh, the gigabytes per square inch. On the left here we have one that more represents SMR uh, where even though it is kind of a line graph you can see up here that it is actually going from 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth so it's very much exponential um, and how it's expected to impact the aerial density it's the same for over here on the right our hammer technologies with both hammer and soma soma coming out between 2013 uh, this year and 2020 we're expecting rapid growth okay we're going to talk about smr and it's abbreviation for Shingle Magnetic Recording. Um, the hard drive company behind this hard drive technology is Seagate. To increase the density of the bits on the hard drive, we need to reduce the bit print, or how much space a bit takes and the buffer zone around it takes. Um, there's two ways to do this. There's PMR, um, and this actually makes this bit size smaller. We'll say the bit is approximately 75 nanometers. Um, the goal of PMR is to make it smaller than 75 nanometers. Um, this has been implemented for the past decade around 2004 is when it first came out by pr most manufacturers. Um, SMR on the other hand wants to make the area between the bits smaller, the buffer zone that separates the bits. Um, and Seagate has just started to distribute hard drives implementing SMR technology um, and they say they've released about one million hard drives with this technology inside of it. Currently a right head writes a path that is 75 nanometers wide. Um, this results in aerial density of 700 gigabytes per square inch. But as you can see in the picture right here two-thirds of the right space is wasted. Um, this gray area above and below is the buffer zone between different tracks. And 
even here you have guard space in between the buffer zones since it doesn't know exactly how wide SMR it technology be is aptly named with shingling since they're very very similar um, for SMR technology it tries to overlap all of the extra gray wasted space um, this causes a layered look just like as shingles and this allows about three times the amount of data to be written in the same area. Since SMR technology has such a great overall impact on the aerial density, you would think that more companies and everybody would be trying to use this. Obviously there is a very major problem that prevents the implementation of SMR. Um, Using an SMR, just like on a roof, you start from the bottom of the roof and go up since they overlap each other. Um, this causes problems when you need to make edits inside of the stack or replace a shingle. Um, the way that Seagate has started to overcome this problem is by creating blocks of data instead of having a whole roof. There's only part of a roof. So if you need to change something inside the disk, if you look at just the picture of the shingles here, if you want to place this shingle right here, using your basic te technology, you'd have to replace all the shingles underneath of it on this whole picture. But Seagate has created algorithms and stuff and the like thing. To replace this shingle, all you have to do is replace the ones immediately in the surrounding area. The future of SMR is looking very bright. As I already talked about, there have already been one million hard drives shipped. Um, and these are were just one terabyte hard drives, just as an introduction to see how the technology works. Um, there have been no reports of problems with the increased write times from the changing of the blocks. Um, next year, there is going to be five terabyte hard drives according to Seagate's website and they predict that by 2020 they will have 20, hard, 20 terabyte hard drives out on the market that implement SMR. One of the more promising technologies that will be uh, implemented soon to increase aerial density is the camera technology for heat assisted magnetic recording. Um, it is mainly worked on by Seagate and Western Digital right now, however there is no other. We're doomed. Before we start talking about how heat and hammer can increase aerial density, let's talk previously about how aerial density has attempted to be increased by bit size. Now, originally and still today, we have bits are held in material that holds a magnetic value. Let's say this previous standard on the left. What we've attempted to do is shrink that size to something like on the right. Under the form of a limit, however, when looking to reduce the size as with temperature remaining constant so far, hammer will change that, uh, with, re with it remaining constant, the smaller the size gets, the less uh, magnetic energy we're able to pull, more or less, from the bit and read that data to interpret it as a one or a zero. So there's a minimum size before we can change the temperature, and that's kind of where hammer comes into play hammer and heat, we are actually able to shrink that limit size, so right about here, into something even smaller like hammer would like to go to over here. So they're actually expecting to be able to put one terabyte to 20 terabytes into a square inch sometime between now and 2020 is the expected date. To do this, they're actually using, well, a much more detailed, but a, this is the shrunk down version of an equation in the lower left hand corner here where T is the temperature and it actually helps imbalance this equation so that the uh, magnetic value for that data point can actually resonate and be read with smaller quantities of material held there with an increase in temperature and a decrease in volume which is the V. Bit size being reduced to such a small value, we're also having to create a laser that can pinpoint that node heating up just that node and not the ones around it. To do that, they're finding that the air is actually becoming a problem, where the diffraction in the air is creating heat diffusion across other nodes, and so they're actually having to more or less use a 
gold and silver to attempt to focus this laser to this specific node that it's attempting to target. This here, what we're looking at is two different diagrams of the laser itself. The one on the left here um, showing a few of the different components in it. These two images display the laser itself and how it actually reads and writes and points to the disc. The one on the left here doesn't point to the disc or anything, but it does show the inside of the laser and how exactly it works with the optical grating and core layers. So it's actually focusing it into a parabola more or less and pointing it out in a very refined location. And what I was talking about with air is when it exits this, it's actually having a problem between here and the somewhere between four to eight nanometers uh, between that and the disc itself which you can kind of see on this one as well. The blue here is the disc, and it has the laser coming down and actually heating it, as you can see with the green here. Talk a little bit about how the heat and the laser get to the disc. However, we haven't really talked about how the heat interacts with the disc. As you can see here, on the right-hand side, we have each of these are a node or point that is holding data and what it's attempting to do is target a specific node. When the laser comes down it does heat it up and it heats it up to right about 550 Kelvin as it shows right here and it does have a trail so doing one next to each other so let's say that you wanted to read this node and then you wanted to read this node it would actually have some residual heat left over from the previous one making it easier to heat up and that actually takes about 1.05 nanoseconds to heat something up to 500 Kelvin. So this is a very nice laser. When heating it up, it actually heats it up so that it can be red, as you can oversee here. As the laser heats up a node on the left here, it actually takes it from a temperature right about here where it's a storage temperature, and will heat it up to what we need for reading and writing, which, once again, as talked about, brings out the magnetic value in that because it's so small it can't be done without the heat itself. We're going to talk about microelectromechanical systems now or MEMS for short. Um, ST Microelectronics is the main company behind this type of architecture. Here's some general information about MEMS before we get into the nitty-gritty details. <clears throat> um, currently MEMS is five to ten faster than current hard drive <coughs> hard drives. Um, this is very significant but the problem is is that it produces a lot of heat and requires a lot of power so most MEMS discs only are 1 to 10 gigabytes in size. This being said, they are used in hybrid discs to allow for the faster read and writes and used as a buffer with normal hard drives behind it for the larger caches. Um, MEMS is also non-volatile. There are a lot of terms with the MEMS architecture so we're going to get some of those out of the way first. The tip arrays, those are the equivalent to a read-write head on a normal hard drive. The difference, however, is that there are between 200 and 2,000 tip arrays per MEMS hard drive. The media sled is the equivalent to the platter. However, the media sled is rectangular in shape and it is based on an XY coordinate system. The tip region is the area that a tip array is able to read. Each of the tip arrays only has access to a certain amount of bits, usually 2500 by 2500 bits. So if there's 200 tip arrays, there will be 2500 by 2500 times 200 and that would be how many bits that that media slide can hold. The whole thing is accessed using tip sectors which is defined as a coordinate system with the X and Y grid. In the uh, third coordinate is the tip and that refers to what tip number it has. So each tip array has its own X and Y coordinate system. The next three terms are more general terms that don't matter too much, but they are useful. The tip track is all of the bits that a tip array is able to access on the x-axis. So just reading one row of data. The cylinder 
is all the tip tracks combined in one x axis the logical sector is all of the <clears throat> tip regions that are able to be read at once all of the tip regions are next to each other but due to physical con constraints the ones next to each other are not necessarily able to be read and be able to be read or read upon at the same time so logical sectors are divided into areas that can be working in parallel and it is that parallelism that allows the speeds to be extremely high. Over on the right we have a chart showing the basic sizes and sp speed of a MEMS architecture. Um, for this one it's very common is has a 3.2 gigabyte sled capacity uh, if you look at the seek times, the average is only 0.55 milliseconds. The maximum is 0.81. This MEMS has 1,280 concurrent tips, which means it can be doing 1,280 reads at the exact same time. That is a lot of parallelism, which causes the maximum throughput of this MEMS architecture to be 89.6 megabytes per second. That is fast. Here we have a visual visualization of what a MEMS architecture looks like. Right here this bold box would be your tip region with the whole thing being your media sled obviously. Each tip array is only allowed to read and write inside of the tip region which only has in this example 5 bits squared. Um, the tip sector is your your coordinate system, so X, Y, and tip. So this would be tip 1 right here in the bottom, and this has its own X and Y coordinate. This is tip 2, tip 3. And that's how it references what's inside of the MEMS architecture. This is a blown up version. Um, this is your tip track, everything <coughs> following this one X axis. The uh, cylinder is all of them combined, all the tip tracks lined up. And the logical sector is not shown, but it could be that only one out of this row could get re used, uh, while one out of this one and one out of this one. You can't have multiple ones, kind of like Sudoku, actually. Here are the papers that we used in finding this information. Um, Thank you for listening to us, and we hope you learned a lot about the new and upcoming technologies used in hard drives.